<laughs> okay, um, congratulations once again. Um, this is really a great opportunity for all of you to collaborate. And as uh, Dr. Mote and Dr. Tian mentioned, this is about development of talent. I think as you look at your own engineering colleges and schools, you've noticed that uh, the enrollments have increased across the nation in public and privates. I mean, it can't be a better time to be a faculty member in the field of engineering education and delivering to this talent pool that we're getting now. So, and I can't think of a better speaker um, to be our keynote speaker to talk about the technology advancements and engineering educational advancements than Xavier Fulge. So I'm gonna read his bio and then have him come up and give his uh, presentation. So after graduation as an industrial engineer in Ecole Centrale de Lille, uh, Xavier Fogé started his career in 1986 as an attache for science and technology at the French Embassy in Austria, in charge of science and technology cooperation. With DS, with Dassault Systems since 1990, he spent several years developing new digital processes to enhance collective innovation in the automotive in industry. He worked as a principal advisor to engineering leaders in various countries with a focus on Germany, Korea, and Japan. In 2003, he created the DS Academy, the corporate organization supporting skills, producing educational innovation, and encouraging transformative learning initiatives related to the use of the company's software. He developed and introduced in France a nationwide award-winning STEM program currently involving over 11,500 high school students mentored by 500 university students. His efforts to promote the engineering profession led him to implement various cutting edge educational activities for secondary and vocational education in USA, Malaysia, and Canada. In higher education, his focus is on facilitating multidisciplinary learning, industry cooperation, and international activities with the aim to build educator skills in product life cycle management, PLM, he initiated competency centers in India, China, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, South Africa, and Vietnam, and established in 2009 the Dissault Systems PLM in Low Tech Context Chair of KIIT University in Blues Bonnesoir uh, country. He regularly provides advanced seminars in collaborative innovation in several institutions, including the French Eco Polytechnic and the HEC Business School. Working with policymakers, he has developed educational programs at country scale in support of national priorities, particularly in Tunisia and the United Arab Emirates. A founding member of the International Federation of Engineering Education, Xavier Fogé was instrumental in the creation of the Global Engineering Dean's Council. His international work also includes the promotion of grand challenges for engineering in the global student community. Xavier Fogé is managing corporate research on virtual labs, teaching co-creation and product innovation, crowd-based curriculum creation, realistic use of 3D and MOOCs, and flipped labs and virtualization of textbooks and learning devices. He leads the company's participation with universities involved in educational research projects supported by national and international funding agencies. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Xavier Fogé. Thank you, Derry. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you also to the Academy for having me. Uh, it's horrible to listen to your own biography when it starts to get so long. It's, I realized I, I'm older than the Academy. Uh, the subject I will have the pleasure to discuss a little bit with you today is uh, uh, how uh, digital technologies are changing, impacting, inspiring uh, engineering education. Uh, on this introduction chart, you see I'm uh, in charge of an organization in industrial systems that is um, promoting engineering education and promoting new practices, digital-based practices in engineering education. I'm also vice president of the European Society for Engineering Education, and I'm looking beyond technologies when I have the pleasure to interact with people like you who want to advance the subject. The chance I have is to work with a company that produces this stuff, software that enables you to see things before they exist. 
It's, it's exciting because it touches everything. It's exciting because it's central to engineering. Engineering is about predicting and to predict your model. And this is about modeling. And the last reason why it's exciting uh, for me in an educational uh, related role, it's because when you try to generate interest from young people, this stuff looks like video games. Uh, unlike video games, this is all about things that will exist. So we do need to visualize them, but we do need also to anticipate how these things will behave from a physical point of view, from a, a logical point of view, from an embedded software point of view, from a behavioral point of view, from a, an emotional point of view, because more, more and more products that we create have been engineered from, for what is called an experience, and that includes the engineering of the user's experience and the emotions of the users. And nothing is more strange to a traditional engineer than engineering emotions. However, it is getting a very central subject to competitive engineering. So, and we do that using, uh, producing, by producing software that uh, uh, some of you may know, uh, design software such as SolidWorks, such as Katia. Uh, software for manufacturing, planning the, planning the, the lines, uh, assembly lines, for instance, the one you see on the top, it's 300 robots you have to orchestrate in an automotive assembly line. So you need some tool to do that to make sure they, they work collaboratively. Uh, tools like, uh, uh, just recently our boss started to do shopping and he purchased a lot of companies across this planet to extend the, to extend the playground of what we do beyond manufacturing to the modeling of biologic systems. So we purchased a, a very large uh, company in the United States called Axeris. Uh, and then we purchased also a software company for modeling the underground in Canada called Gemcon. They, they model the, what happens below the surface to plan the mining activity. So we start gradually to aggregate to this tools that were initially designed for manufacturing products uh, to aggregate tools that represent life and that represent the environment. These two things, life, environment, become the context of product innovation. And we provide computer models that create the, the working context uh, for designing these experiences, experience of a new product. In terms of education, this is my dream. Uh, making education ubiquitous so that anyone can learn from anywhere, anything with anyone else. This anyone else being somewhere, sometimes at the other end of the planet. And, and digital tools are ideal for doing that, because this ubiquity we, we, we have between learners and teachers, across learners, across teachers, but also more and more between learners and learning devices, this ubiquity we can only have in a digital manner. That's my daily work. We research, we use this technology to define new ways of teaching. This we do in the form of uh, collaborations with the universities and uh, uh, going after 
research grants, the way you go, together with universities, and uh, at least there is one here in this room, Georgia Tech, we have been working with for doing that. And we do that across the world. So we learn from many different places, and the outcomes we transfer to all the users of our technology, and we implement, we work with them in projects or in larger nationwide programs. The, the, the domain of operation is from uh, grade six to PhD. And uh, the focus of our activity is are these four boxes, the digital learning practices, how to use these techni techniques that are used in industry for improving another type of business that is called education. Professional practices, it's very difficult in academia to keep track of the changes that happen in industry. Not, not the changes in engineering principles, but the changes in engineering practices. And our role is to make it easier for educators who want to uh, adopt the, 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 the practices from industry and to transfer the practices, the recent practices, into uh, their courses. I give you one example to make that sensible. Uh, I, I remember a conference uh, a few years ago in Europe, it was in Berlin, 300 deans and heads of schools from all Europe sitting in an amphitheater in front of someone from Airbus, complying, crying, that uh, um, they would have expected to see young graduates mastering a uh, narrow space engineering technique called digital mockup. It's not just uh, replacing prototypes, it's more than that, it's a methodology, it's a, an organization of work. Complaining about that because this was a type of skills that in their eyes caused a delay in their A380 program. There were other causes, but this one, one of the big ones. A skill that was invented 10 years before on the paper in the University of Michigan. I mean, th this notion of digital mockup was theorized 10 years before. So it had taken 10 years until this practice that was inv invented as a research subject in an industry became a subject of teaching in universities. And this is, this is the, the cycle that I feel with uh, all my team, we have to try to compress. And I'm very happy to be in front of people who feel themselves as ed innovators in the way we educate. Because if, if I'm not happy with you, I'm happy with no one. <laughs> Interdisciplinary collaboration is central to the creation of, of skills that are key for competitive engineering. Uh, we, are, we keep saying engineers are problem solvers. Problems do not have the politeness to be limited in one discipline. And international collaboration, the connectivity we have across the planet is making that essential when we create curricula. The, we think international relation in a university is about having exchange programs. Yes, it is that. We think it is about uh, visiting, exchanging professors. Yes, it is all that. But it is also providing students with an actual experience of engineering something, something together with students who are somewhere else, because that's just the way it happens in industry. You are not meeting with the other engineers in the other countries that work with you on that airplane or car or whatever program. You must learn how this happens. It's not just, it's not just doing things as if you would do them with your neighbor. It's very different when they are waking up when you go to bed. It's different when they are not speaking your uh, unit language, they are, they are imperial, your metric, or vice versa. 
It's not the same if, if they do not negotiate the way you negotiate, etc. These all must be taught, and for all these, we have to help, we, my group, has to help the uh, uh, universities to implement actual uh, experiencing opportunities for students to learn these attitudes, not just aptitudes. These are attitudes. And attitudes you don't learn on books, in books, you learn by doing. The subject. <laughs> the, uh, it, it has been, it has been a, 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 a an obsessional conversation subject over the five last years, so just because it it has, it has something to it relates to the business model of of the education system, I think that's the main reason. Uh, I don't define MOOCs; uh, it would be an insult to you to to say what that means. Uh, but MOOCs, as any buzz, as any trend, as any new thing uh, follows a path by which after the uh, big excitement uh, people start to realize what it is exactly and what it is not and, and start to make it substantial, more substantial. And I think that we have just passed this point, this is not me, this is a this is a, an assessment made by the Gartner Group. This curve, the hype curve, is their uh, IP. And I think they are very right in, in saying that we have passed the point where the noise about MOOCs is getting, uh, is fading, while the action about MOOCs is now taking substance. I, I would give you a more substantial view on that. Of course, but it cannot be ignored. It's, it's, it has impact on, on the business model of universities. Uh, it could be ignored because many people say uh, completion rates are low, uh, costs, uh, cost of, not of taking a MOOC, but cost of creating a MOOC can be high. Faculty reluctance, why should I distribute for free my core knowledge? Business models, how should institutions uh, make money out of that? What is the model? Uh, the learning experience, the learners experience in front of a MOOC, how efficient is that? Could that not be improved? Of course I will say yes, because that's where I want to play. And it's a big money, it's a big market. Uh, the expectation in, in about 10 years from now is, uh, how you call that, one trillion, one tera, tera dollar, 1.4 tera dollar. <laughs> but this is, this is not just MOOC, these numbers is all what will happen online. And online will happen also, I think, an increase in distant practices such as flip classrooms, flip learning, which is not MOOC, it's just distant learning for your own students, which is a subject in which I strongly believe in terms of its uh, educational ef uh, efficiency. Flipping is good for uh, learning. I'm convinced of that. Uh, it's just about doing the homework before doing the classwork. That's the flip. And the curves you see on the right here are just uh, one among many examples uh, of the efficiency it creates in the learning uh, of students. These are the uh, rankings of uh, students before and after flipping a classroom in electrical engineering in the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. 
and they publish this. And I think this, the, the curves say something nice. It says there are less people in the classroom that are, who are left behind. And the average, the average uh, ranking improves. Yes, just because the, 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 the one way in learning interaction be, between the lecturer and the, and, the teach, and the students happens before, and what happens during the class is then an interactive activity. Both MOOCs and flip class require a specific attitude from the learner because you are not in front of a human, you are in front of a computer in most of the cases while you take your course before taking the physical one, the, 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 the residential one, or while, while you take a distant course on the MOOC, you are in front of a machine. How to make that experience more engaging? That's where I want to play. Especially when the nature of, of this learning is engineering. Engineers in any country, in any system, in any university, they go through these five types of exercises, of learning events. One through lectures, this will continue to exist, even though uh, this will be reduced probably and, and replaced by virtual lectures. <laughs> exercises are interesting. It's an exercise, it's it's the, the perversion of a problem solving. Because an exercise is, is a single disciplinary. The teacher knows the answer. While a problem is multidisciplinary. And usually the teacher does not know the answer. So the, the problem solving is really at the core of engineering, while exercises are, of course, necessary. but in support of a single discipline. Textbooks keep still exist and, and will still exist uh, in, in, in paper or electronic format. And they are still a, a, a fundamental channel through which we learn. Lab sessions are activities in which students are uh, applying hands-on what they have learned or discovering uh, by interacting with material objects, with devices, with the instrumentation, with equipment, with whatever, physical things. Uh, the lab can be a, a, a programming lab, but it's not so physical, but still the object of the study is physically there. I do not have a lot of things to, to tell you about new things, about to tell you about lecturing or making an exercise. This is not a place where we as a uh, a software company feel we have something to say. Uh, we rather have something to say in the next three uh, bubbles I have shown here. Textbooks. The way textbooks are uh, digitalized, usually it's uh, by creating a computer metaphor of a physical paper book. You will flip pages, you will mark, etc. The idea of uh, uh, Textbooks is that, my idea of textbooks is that we, it could be much better. So we started to extend textbooks with 3D content uh, in uh, an experiment that is currently ongoing in France in uh, high schools, in the two last years of high schools in the course of technology. On the left here you see the book and on each page of the book there are illustrations that were so far, the, the most engaging piece of media kids had in front of them. Uh, what we have done is, by working with the publishers and with the students, with the professors, their teachers, is that we have put online, associated with each page of this book, the 3D content of these illustrations, so that they can manipulate, they can rotate, they can turn around, they can the teachers can do exercises. This is currently being uh, tested. Uh, the, the students in this track are about 17,000 in the country. And we start to see uh, the first feedbacks. There will be a, a 
a more detailed report about that uh, at the end of this school year. But this is very encouraging. The technology that is used to do that is very simple to use. I mean, if you may have existing 3D content in your pockets or in your computers or on the internet that helps you teach. You can use this type of tool to, to implement this in any of your courses, online or uh, in your PowerPoints, if you want. The lab is an important moment in learning for an engineer because that's a contact with the reality, that's a interaction with uh, the practice. And when you look at things that happens in lab or with lab equipments, most of these things today can be modeled in a computer, not just visually, but also in terms of their physical behavior. So you can create now computer models that combine the appearance, the, the geometry of something, with the behaviors of this thing. So if the thing is a lab device, you can create a virtual version, an avatar, a functional avatar of that device, and then you can imagine the zillions of scenarios by which uh, students would be using this equipment before going into the lab at a distance. Well, I have examples just after. Another characteristic of these videos is uh, the, the, on, on the real uh, use of the device, which is on, on the second and third and fourth column, you see usually a single person using the material, the equipment. Yes, it's fragile, students are, are uh, breaking that, so there is a risk, so I do it myself, I don't give it to the student. And this way we have uh, been working in the last years together with uh, uh, lab equipment makers, such as this one, uh, I will not comment this one, but uh, I prefer to comment this one. What you see here is, uh, Forget this robot here because he was just watching the scene, so he, had, he has <laughs> nothing to say. The, we are looking at this robot here. We have, we have here a totally ver digital version of this robot and of the control program, the, which is an Arduino a piece of electronic. For those who know Arduino, uh, it will be very familiar. It's very popular. Uh, this type of electronic uh, controls any type of uh, electromechanical device, such as this robot. And we have connected this uh, computer model, which is in the CATIA system, together with this Arduino model so that we can drive syn synchronously the physical and the virtual version of this robot. It could be anything, not just a robot. It could be uh, any device. What is interesting is that uh, the, uh, the, the, the scene here is watched by a webcam that is uh, which uh, is uh, generating this video frame here. So this can be separated, this, the equipment and the learner, can be separated by several time zones. That's why in, you see on the right picture, we have, a, we have a, a lamp here. This is just because when we do that in Korea, and this is equipment is in Paris, it's night in Paris when they use the equipment. So the, this opens a lot of perspectives for teleoperated lab sessions. It, it opens a lot of perspective also for learning the practices of operating something that is remote. It's not just uh, accessing equipment that we do not have in our lab, but that is in another lab. It's also about learning how to do this type of remote work. And once you have virtualized labs, a real, R stands for real lab, a real lab you can use for about several dozens of students at a time. If you virtualize it, you can first do what 
you, 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 you combine virtual and real access to this lab. You still send stu your students into the real lab, but for a shorter time. Because they will have time, most of their time they will have spent in using the virtual lab. And go to the real one to verify that what they have prepared is appropriate. Same as we do in, in industry. We try to do right first time by doing wrong in the computer and then doing right when it comes to, to, to reality. And by the way, it's also an occasion to teach the right first time attitudes. It's also to teach an occasion to teach the difference between the idealization that is in the computer and the reality of systems. It's never, it's never happening the way you simulated. And, and, and the difference between an engineer and a kid is to know that. And you have to make engineers out of kids. So that, that's a way to also to tell them what you see in, in computers is a certain level of approximation of the reality. And then you go to the unknown number of people. If you just provide them with the digital version of your lab, you don't give them access to the real lab. You don't mix, you don't blend these two but then you reach a very large number of people and increase the attractiveness, the engaging aspect of your MOOCs. Problem? Problem solving. Uh, I just uh, want to, to give you a, maybe some of you know this study made by ASWE, T-U-E-E. -E. Don't ask me what it means. I, I remember well the name because it, in French, T-U-E -E means killed. It's feminine, it's a lady has been killed. <laughs> I'm sorry for the ladies. The, this, this study is very interesting. It was made by gathering uh, employers, large companies in the United States in, and trying to have them define uh, what are competences that they value. And if you look at their top ranking here, it starts with international and global perspective, informational technology, system integration, project management, supervision, planning, scheduling, budgeting, etc. These were the top, of the top four of, of their competences they listed. And the question is in, 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 uh, in uh, universities, how do we teach that? How do we bring that to, to students? It's difficult because uh, the traditional formats are not designed for that. I want to give you a few examples of how digital technologies helped to, to do that. Uh, providing students with an international uh, problem-solving exercise. So I, I invite you to watch first this side here. This happens in university. This is a project that was involving these universities across this planet uh, with interesting aspects. The, 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 the one the most uh, on, the, on the west was in, in Peru and the most in the east was in China with 13 hour time difference. The exercise for students was about designing a fully featured, fully functional uh, factory, uh, car assembly factory, across these sites, these universities. There, are, there is no US universities. That, that you will not see them. Uh, there will be maybe this time, because this is yearly repeating. And it's led by one of these universities. And each time, if you want to join, you can join. The exercise uh, was involving the actual practice of collaborative innovation. Producing a result with people who are not sitting together with you, who think differently and work differently. This was so successful, they decided to repeat that. Uh, this year they are in the third, uh, repeti uh, third iteration. Uh, it's it's Every year between September and January, students by groups of uh, about five per university are all working on the same subject. This way of working requires tools such as, of course, representing the ideas, the, the, the technical aspects, but also tools for enabling the collaboration. 
tools for enabling the technical collaboration and tools for enabling the social collaboration. Because these projects require conflicts, require conflicts of ideas. Requires consensus building, requires planning, requires interaction between people to people, not people to objects or people to data, but people to people. So we, we use for that a kind of uh, private Facebook technology that is uh, uh, tightly linked to the technical collaboration. So we have the technical collaboration and we have the human collaboration that are sustained both by systems and those two systems are interconnected. The same applies to uh, the exercise we, we have defined here together with Georgia Tech in, uh, for, for high schools in, for, in summer camps. What they do is summer camps across three sites in that case that was uh, in 2012, 13, but this year there were more than three sites. There were five, if I remember right. Five different universities in which summer camps happen synchronously at the same time. And kids, by teams that are dispersed across the universities, produce a single result. In that case, not a factory, but a programmable Lego Mindstorms robot in which they change some of the parts that are in the box by creating their own using 3D printing. So they are forced into a distant collaboration situation the same way engineers are uh, practicing every day. And in my example for the, for the digital factory, the global factory that was the name of that project for the, for the universities, this year, they have changed the subject. It's not a factory anymore. They have to design a farmer's experience. This is centered on a trend in agriculture that is called precision agriculture, which will be a wave, a strong wave in the way we engineer agriculture. And what they do here is that they have they will design the farmer as experience. What happens in the farmer's day, in the practice of the farmer? And this then becomes the specification for a technical system that will support this farmer's practice. Systems engineering is getting uh, uh, central to many of the projects engineers work on. They are more complex and we need more methodologies in combining disciplines into complex solutions, solutions to complex problems. The example you see here is uh, another one. It's, that's a very co cool one. It, worldwide, you can observe that there is an increasing need for teaching systems engineering. You see, look at the, look at the uh, uh, proposal for jobs. There are many proposals for uh, systems engineering professors. The reason is uh, the need for that competence in industry and the fact that most, more and more of the uh, businesses need that skills, this type of skills. Here is the, uh, an example of how, how one school has been taken the, the issue of creating a problem-based learning course for uh, systems engineering. It's totally based on case studies. The theory comes after. So it's a little bit like the Harvard the business school. It's case study based. Students of these schools, of, of this school, it's a French one, they have received five million uh, euro to do that. It's, it's a funded research. Uh, are currently collecting subjects for the case studies. So they go, the rule is they have to go to a, a, another country than their own. And they have to be mentored by a university from this country during an internship in a company in this country. It's a little bit complex, but that's the way they have chosen to generate international examples. This 
names you see here are the, were the first ones. They have m many more now who joined that program. It's still open. They are still looking for uh, uh, universities who want to mentor a student exchange for that type of uh, project. The students go to the companies, model on the computer the problem and the solution, and that becomes part of the curriculum. The, uh, the, the example in the United States was with Georgia Tech and a company called uh, Skywind Power. It was about uh, uh, s testing the, the modeling first, the uh, a system of uh, uh, energy producing uh, windmills that are flying in the high-speed airstreams without, without consuming their power. And what, what they concluded is that it was not possible. It, it's better to conclude it on a virtual prototype than on a real one. The, the equation of, between the, the energy production and the energy you need to sustain that, that object in the air uh, was not positive enough. But this is a, another cool program that shows that uh, with digital technology, you will be able to tackle complex learning uh, subjects, especially those that you were not able to address before because they are international, because they are multidisciplinary. And the last example, that's the very last one. Be an engineer is a program that we have developed for the freshmen, inspired by what, what some US universities did, especially Purdue with their first year program. Uh, give them an experience, an end-to-end -end experience of what engineering is in a, in a shrinked manner, in a simplified manner, but right at the beginning just when they come fresh from high school, where you need to deprogram their high school behaviors, <laughs> where you need to give them a, a feeling of what are the disciplines they can learn in your programs. In year two, in semester X, we provide a course on finite elements. What is finite elements when you come out of high school? It has no meaning. Give them that little experience, not of what is the theory of finite elements, but give them the experience of what it is for. During two weeks, they go through such an exercise, integrating multiple disciplines onto one single object, which again is a Lego Mindstorms uh, object that uh, uh, assembly that they will customize. And tell them at the end everything what happened. On Monday, you were uh, purchase engineer because at that day you decided if you would do it yourself or, per, or uh, order, it for, order it from a supplier. If that part you would manufacture yourself or you, you take it from the standard Lego box. On Tuesday you were a manufacturing engineer, etc. And take the time at the end, this all is, is described in the course material because the course material is, in, is the form of uh, deliverable we then provide at the end of all this research. At the end, tell them uh, uh, the, 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 the discipline. You remember when we, we, we looked at how it breaks or not, where, is it, where it is fragile, this non-standard Lego brick that you designed. This technique is called finite element. It is boring, but you know what it is for. And as a conclusion, I would say that the, the, we speak about the Internet of Things. Is not education the first place where the Internet of Things is about to happen? The things we are talking about are diverse, distant, and connected. The things are learners, educators, devices, content, learning content, courses. Are we not at the beginning of uh, an era where a curriculum will be just a navigation through the ideal combination of these four types of 
components, wherever they come from, wherever they are. I think we are. Industry will do. Industry will connect your fridge to tell your driverless car that it's time to go purchase some milk. But in education, we can do the same. And we can do better, and we can do, we can advance education, and we can advance the notion of Internet of Things at the same time doing the, doing the same things. That's my conclusion message. All of that is applicable to many, many different disciplines, not just the traditional uh, manufacturing uh, disciplines in which you would expect a company like ours to operate. Our largest customer is not Boeing anymore. It's uh, Procter & Gamble. So the time is changing. The context is broadening. The context of engineering is broadening from products to products in life. And that's our challenge, and that's yours. And if we can do things with you to make that more enjoyable, we are more than volunteer to do that, and you are more than welcome to send me insults and questions to that email. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience before we go to the break. Yes. Yes. The, there is a cool thing as, when you are a speaker, when you receive. A, Can you sort of repeat the question in abbreviated Yes, yes. I will, I will do it. I will do it. Uh, well, the, 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 by, by listening to the answer, you will understand the questions. The, the, uh, there is a cool thing when there is a list of questions like that, and if, if one of them is embarrassing, you just answer the other ones. But I will try to answer all of yours uh, because. Uh, 
uh, starting with, you said software has a price. Yes, it has a price. Uh, uh, less and less and smaller and smaller, but it has a price. The, uh, when you purchase a physical equipment, you purchase it. Why, when it does the same virtually, would you not do that? So, but it, it, we are making big efforts, and this is a continuing uh, activity to make it more and more affordable. That's number one. Be because we, we just want these practices to proliferate in education. Number two, I think it's more a, a more fundamental question that you ask, is about the, the challenge we put on educators. The question was, are we not with all these technologies uh, putting a, too much a challenge on the educators who are to teach their disciplines, the theory, and, and at the same time, uh, practices that relate to uh, the IT side of that, the reason IT side, that is more and more discreet, that is more and more transparent, but still there. The arrogant way to answer the question is to tell you, uh, this is the way it happens in industry. And you are supposed to produce people who are uh, uh, industry savvy. So you better adjust. <laughs> uh, but I know by experience that this does not work. Uh, and to make it work, what we have been trying is to constantly produce help, assistance, and material to that very activity, which is adoption by the teacher, by the educators. Our production, what my lab produces in the company, is nothing else than teacher-oriented material and teacher-oriented teacher assistance. Helping teachers to, ad because we can do, uh, we, alternatively, we could wait. We know that in one or two generations, uh, teachers will adopt that spontaneously. But we want that to happen early, earlier, now. So that's why we developed the, all this research activity, which ends up always systematically in producing uh, classroom-ready material for uh, educators, producing educators' professional development activities. For instance, we, we do a lot through ASWE. And we do that in many other countries than the United States. And funding that with the little money that we receive from licenses. So you have my business model now. That we, 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 we have small license fees to fund uh, a research and uh, material development activity to help educators adopt these techniques in their daily practice, because we know it's not always easy. So that's what we do at our scale. Uh, the, we are not a big company. We are 15,000 in the world. But if you look at our challenges, they are exactly the ones that the academy has uh, identified, exactly. So, uh, including, including the, the one that relates to education, uh, advanced personalized learning, that's the way it's formulated. Uh, so, that's my answer, a model by which, yes, we, we, we require some license fees, reasonable and decreasing over time, and we use that to facilitate adoption in practice. Uh, with that, I think I covered some of your questions. I forgot. Let's get, let's get another question. You can talk to the break. Uh, See you at the break. Yeah. And Dan, introduce yourself yeah. and what uh, university you're from.
Uh, I will not uh, start a crusade against the command line. <laughs> but uh, at the end, most of the things an engineer do are 3D. I, I would not like to fly in an airplane that would have been designed only by text-based interactions. So, yes, one form of interaction is not replacing the previous form. We are not, we are not saying, forget what you did and, and do different. We are saying you should do more than what you have done so far. It will be at the at the end, everyone will find the balance between the expression media that is most appropriate to their job. So it's not a crusade against the common line, no. It's uh, a preach about uh, more commonly spoken language. sometimes learn how to use the word processor copy paste and all these things and then we give them an exam which is written. Right? And we see that some of them can't even write because they've been so used to using technology. And so I feel like it has to close the loop. If not, we have a situation where students are very adept with using software, but then we now bring them when it comes to the exam to paper based, to be based exam. So how are you why are you thinking of excluding that? Yeah, okay. The, I, I perfectly agree with you. It's, it's, it, literacy is, uh, comp is also uh, uh, with text, with language, with uh, 2D, with different formats. The only thing I wanted to say here, in here is that we as a company are not a player in this domain. Uh, this does not say is that it's not important, but we, we try to be active in the places where our technology is relevant, and that's then more when the reality is involved, when the representation, a realistic representation, is involved. The more you go symbolic, in terms of speaking about a computer model of the language, text, word processing, whatever, uh, the less we have technologies to provide and that's it. It's just a question of positioning ourselves. I was absolutely not saying that this is uh, to be neglected. No, I was just saying we have nothing special to add to that conversation. 